Hello and welcome to the first of our Cane Warriors webinars brought to you by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Beckford's Tower and the State of Trust. I'm your host, Terry Badu. Our first webinar is focused on Beckford's Tower and Tacky's Rebellion. And to explore that theme, I'm joined by Dr. Amy Frost, noted historian and senior curator of the Bath Preservation Trust. Alex Wheatle, best-selling novelist and author of the book, Cane Warriors. And Deborah Badu an award-winning champion of black dance in the UK, who's creating a dance theatre version of Cane Warriors scheduled for March of next year. Welcome to our panel. And uh, with everybody here, um, Alex, let's get some context. Uh, what was Tacky's Rebellion? Taki's Rebellion, I first heard of it from speaking to my mother. My mother grew up in a small town of Richmond in St. Mary, Jamaica. And when she was a young girl, she used to hear these whispers from the elders about Taki's Rebellion and that Taki was walking these very lands because the Trinity and Frontier plantations were very adjacent to where she grew up. And so by word of mouth, these stories, what well, a legend had lingered on for centuries even. And so um, basically, Taki and his uh, fellow cane warriors, they decided that um, they had enough of their condition, their slavery condition, you know, too many atrocities had taken place. And so in 1760, on Easter Sunday, they decided that will be the day when they rise up for the uprising. And they're gonna take on the British, take on the slave masters and fight for their freedom. The Cane Warriors is obviously fictional. Your book is fictional. Um, it's a real life commentary on slavery uh, and the British Empire. What were the goals of your book? The goals of my book were essentially to um, basically educate our young people because um, going to school in the UK, I never knew anything about Caribbean history or even rebellion. I heard about slavery and so on, but not so much about the rebellion part. And so I felt that was missing. So I really wanted to include in my um, in my fiction that indeed there were resurrections in the Caribbean throughout, not just Jamaica, but Barbados. In fact, most of the islands, you know. Um, and so I was really determined to write a narrative that um, centered on a 14 year old boy because getting information on Taki was quite difficult. There were conflicting um, narratives there. And I wasn't quite sure of his background in Africa because he did come from Africa. But I thought, so, OK, let me um, build a fictional character and he can tell the story through his 14 year old eyes of Taki and the rest of the Cane Warriors as his 14 year old follows the revolt and the rebellion. And Dr. Amy, again, again, for context, can you tell me a little bit about Beckford's Tower? Yeah, so Beckford's Tower is a 120 foot high grade one listed building um, just outside of Bath and was built in 1826, 1827 by William Thomas Beckford, who came to Bath in 1822. And, and, and his wealth, the wealth that builds that building um, was the wealth that he and his family had gained from the ownership of, of sugar plantations in Jamaica. So from the claiming in ownership of of enslaved people um, and the Beckfords had had owned those plantations in Jamaica since 1661 um, and in in 1760 which is the year William Thomas Beckford is is born um, which is the year of of of, of Tacky's um, rebellion um, they were really the the, the biggest plantation owning family on Jamaica and one of their plantations that the Isha plantation is is very um central to the route that Taki's rebellion um follows right so Beckford's Tower is like a monument to slavery it's it's yeah built built with the proceeds of, of the profits of slavery absolutely and um and William Beckford himself kind of used it as a a treasure chest it's where he kept his collection um which was a an 
an incredibly influential collection, but a collection entirely paid for um, from, from the profits of, of slavery. And um, it, it's now a, a museum um, in Bath and, and we're under a big development project at the moment um, to when we reopen the museum in March uh, 2024 next year, um, have a redesigned museum so that we can really tell this story and, and tell it really clearly. And, and, and included in the telling of that story is, is telling the story of, of, of Tacky's Rebellion and, and those freedom fighters that were on Beckford owned plantations. And Deborah, how did you get involved in this project to start with? Well, um, the connection with Beckford's Tower um, started last year um, when we were developing a project called Coleridge Unbound. Um, that was looking at Samuel Taylor Coleridge's stance as an abolitionist at that time. And so um, Beckford's Tower heard about that and we actually brought the project to, because there were synergies between the themes, obviously transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so we brought Courage Unbound to Beckford's Tower. And working when we were working on Courage Unbound, we actually based our development of our characters on the characters in Cane Warriors, because I think it was important to be as authentic as possible and so we used key um, characters out of Kane Warriors because we'd already um, had discussions with Alex um, which to build the characters and being actually in Beckford's Tower and in in the land it brought the it was it brought the characters to life because we really um, dug deep into the history of the uh, the tower and engaged with the trauma um, that a lot of slaves um, experienced at the hands of William Beckford and we actually did some filming in the grounds uh, which was quite um, emotional and we worked around William Beckford's actual tomb we filmed so it, it brought a lot of the history to life being in the tower and its grounds um, which really impacted on the development of Cane Warriors when we started to approach that story so oh. it's, it was direct connection and it's great that um, the Tower and the Museum were inspired by that connection between the Tower and Cane Warriors and were able to facilitate the project and make it happen to expose its hidden histories, to reveal hidden histories of the Tower. Can, can you, you guys expand on this alliance? Because on the one hand, you've got Cane Warriors, which was a slave, uh, and the Tacky's Rebellion, which was obviously a rebellion against slavery. And on the other hand, you've got Beckford's Tower, which you know, ostensibly is a, a monument to slavery. So how did the two come together? Well, um, initially, I had no idea about Beckwith's Tower. So I was amazed that this uh, place existed. I'd never even heard of um, William Beckford. I mean, um, yes, I did know about the Trinity and Frontier Plantations where the revolt took place, but I wasn't um, sure about who owned m many of these plantations throughout Jamaica. So it was a surprise to me. And again, it was, um, it was, it was really gave me a boost of energy to um, understand that um, there is still, you know, we can trace back who these owners were. And indeed, it was William Beckford. So to know that there's a monument still standing in his name is amazing. But there are definitely two sides to it. On the one hand, it, 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 it seems to sort of celebrate everything. And and on the other hand, it is Cain Warriors, which is looking at the freedom fighters and rebellion. So it is a bit of a dichotomy there. Yeah, and I think I think we at the museum as well, and and the the people that we're talking to, and the the kind of conversations that we're having, we want to kind of make sure that we're telling the story of all the Beckfords. So when we say, and when we talk in the museum about the Beckfords and, and transatlantic slavery, that's not just the white British Beckfords who, who were the plantation owners. Um, the research we've we've done, um, even through to the legacy today of, of people with the surname Beckford, um, coming from you know, knowing that people held in enslavement on those plantations were were stripped of their African names and 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 forced to take the name of, of the plantation or, or of the owner. Um, there's a story for us 
to tell in the museum about all of those Beckfords. And, and we have two, two historic documents from the 19th century, so not from the, the, the period of, of um, Tacky's Rebellion, but, but of Beckford owned plantations where we actually have names of people um, who were held in enslavement on those plantations. And, and that means we, we're not just talking about the enslaved on, for example, um, the Harbour Head plantation that, that, that William Beckford sold in 1821. We're talking about, um, you know, Richard Beckford, who was 24 um, and held in enslavement. And we're talking um, about William Beckford. I've got the list of them in front of me at the moment. William Beckford, who was 61. And and for us, that that really means that we're, we're exploring about what that name means. And, and in particular, what it means to people today. So the public can come and visit uh, a museum there, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we're closed at the moment for a, um, a, a major kind of refit, thanks to funding again from the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund. And um, it's given us a chance to design the museum for the first time. The museum sort of opened in the 1970s when the building was empty and, and it was a collection of things that had been accumulated and and what we're doing now is involving our local community our um, people that we work with to help kind of inform how we tell the story and and how we try and engage with it in a in a really honest way um and in a way that that it's not just my voice as the curator speaking through the museum it's 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 other people's voices and so we're due to open in march next year and and we 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 hope that that isn't the end. We we keep sort of saying the opening of the museum isn't the end of our work on this. It's it's actually the beginning, and we're designing it to be really flexible so that you know should we find another of those documents that 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 lists names and should we find more information, we can bring that story in. We can change the narrative. We can enlarge on the narrative. The more information that we that we find and the more people that we talk to and the more people that we listen to, which I think is is the key to kind of what we're doing. We're, we're listening to a, a lot of different people and trying to tell the story. So so a, a first edition of Cane Warriors will be in the exhibition when we open and and um, the, the project that, that, you know, this webinar series is about, the, the you know, incredible work that, that, that Deborah and State of Trust are doing. We hope to have a, a film of that playing in, in the exhibition as well, so that, that we're really sort of exploring all sides of the story. I was going to say, is that a, is the presentation of the narrative a difficult balancing act? Because obviously these are times when a, there are calls for atonement regarding the slave trade. Um, so presenting a, a balanced view while still telling the truth must be tough. Yeah, and I think for us, the most important thing is, you know, William Beckford and his father, who confusingly was also called William Beckford, but we'll call him Alderman Beckford or Alderman Sugarcane, as he actually became known from about 1757. Um, they they have immense privilege and immense power. And, and that's a power that made it possible for them to abuse other people and take advantage of other people and the lives of other people. And all of that privilege and power comes from this wealth. It, com it comes from the source of this wealth. So, you know, we will talk about the building and its architecture and how important a building it is architecturally. We will talk about the collection and the objects that, that, that were part of it and how influential they were. But we're always going to talk about the money that paid for them um, and what made that possible and and just how every aspect of these lives was was made possible because of this Im immense and, and obscene actually obscene amount of money and alex what wh why did you want to make this collaboration um, I, i'm always i was always interested in dance expression and i felt you know, I look back to the African traditions of um, telling stories, word of mouth, dance, and the use of the drum. And so um, I knew of Deborah um, already, so I contacted her and, um, you know, I inquired, you know, I said, look, I think this will make a great dance performance, you know, telling the story in this manner. 
Um, and, you know, luckily for me, she agreed. And I think it's, it's a fantastic expression and it takes it back to Africa, if you like, you know, in our original form of expression. So I think that's a great thing. Yeah, it was a lot of journey um, getting there. Um, when Alex first approached us, it was um, three years before we were able to raise the money. Yeah. And we were turned down three times by Arts Council England, who felt that for some reason it wasn't a valid enough project to fund. Um, and so it was great when the National Lottery Heritage Fund stepped in um, through um, Breakfast Tower and Bath Preservation Trust to support this. But this is just step one. It's a research and development project, um, which were um, was taking place in October. Um, but in order to have the full length, all singing, all dancing um, production, which we are aiming for, will take more funding. So if there's anyone out there that wants to invest and support in the full length development of the piece, that'd be great. But we will be doing the research and development in October and people will be able to see um, we're pulling out certain scenes and developing them, experimenting with ideas and themes, dance and music, and then um, we're performing it in Bath and in Bristol. So they'll be able to see um, performance in progress and hopefully we'll be able to develop it to the full length um, piece later on. Can you all talk to me about the challenges of, of bringing this all together from your own perspectives? Uh, from my perspective, um, Arts Council of England, obviously their budgets have been trimmed in recent years, so I know that um, any funding gain for them is hard won. And so, um, but Deborah, she's a determined lady and uh, she thought she found other ways to um, fund this original R&D development program. So I'm really hoping that um, when people come to see this, they see the importance of it, especially when I take the book into schools and the fascination I get from students about this story, because many students have no idea. I mean, obviously they know about Henry VIII and his six wives, they know about the Crusades and so on. But for me, Taki is just as much his hero as Achilles or anybody else in world history. And so um, this rebellion should be celebrated, I feel. You know, so uh, it should be there to be studied and there to be seen and there, and there to be enjoyed. Well, I'm not sure we can enjoy it, but there to be educated about it. So um, that's what it means to me. It's as valid as any other historical, great historical um, piece. So um, that's what we're aiming for, to uh, put this on the stage where it'd be available to the public and especially to young people. Yeah, I mean, we've done some really great workshops so far in schools and communities um, where we bring the scenes to life and we explore them through music and dance and Alex talks to the young people. So it really animates the history and makes it really accessible. That's a really great thing about this project because it is a dark history and it's, it, it's history that people don't usually engage with. Um, I go, uh, I think back to my own education a long time ago, but it, you know, it was even worse then. You didn't really mention anything um, like this. Um, so it really brings it to life, and the young people have really fed back, both learning about um, the tower, Beckford's Tower, and about Kay Morris and the stories. A light bulb has gone on, and they've really, you know, in, been able to engage and learn and you know, be part of the his, history of discovery. So I think education of these kind of topics through the arts is really valuable, especially nowadays. Yes, in fact, it, several schools I've visited in the last two or three years have now adopted Kane Warriors as a key text, a key historical text to be studied by year groups. So as a, as a fantastic achievement already. So there's interest already out there. So I'm really hoping that um, any funders would take this on board and say, oh, they can see the good and the education that it's doing. Is it a difficult, sorry, go ahead, sir, Amy. No, I was just gonna say, I think that, you know, that's that's real part of it as well, is about engaging young people. And, um, and you know, we get a lot of, 
you know, why would people, why would people want to come and visit a, a, a museum and a building that was entirely funded by, uh, by enslavement? And, and actually through projects like this and through the, the way that they can engage particularly with young people, um, you know, we hope that, that that will help encourage people to, 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 to visit it um, and perhaps see it, um, see it differently or see the space differently and and that went back to you know when we first sort of met on site and Deborah was saying earlier about kind of dancing in the space and dancing in the landscape and when we first sort of met the conversations that we had were around you know it is not a comfortable place it is not a comfortable space but what can what can we do what can people do to try and change that or see it differently or claim it or reclaim it um and and certainly um through through you know just seeing those dancers in that space completely changes kind of how you see it and how you feel about it and and it it's you know that that's the sort of engaging those young people is so fundamental um because like you know like like both Deborah and Alex have said you know, we're not we're not teaching this enough in schools so that's where museums can really play a, a, a an important role um in ensuring that 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 history that is absolutely fundamental that is not being taught can be be explored more absolutely and um, uh, i remember my trips to germany my books are quite popular in germany and i've um toured many cities there and i've um read at the literary houses there we're in front of year groups and um from what i understand almost all german schools send their children to holocaust sites where they get to learn about uh, what happened during the second world war and even before the second world war and what happened to those uh, jews who were transported to those sites and so it's part of their curriculum it's part of their learning and really i see cane warriors in the same kind of vein it should be part of our collective learning in the UK. No, that's interesting. So you're saying there's implications beyond the, the people immediately involved, say the British and, and the West Indian Caribbean population, African population, whatever you like to say. Sorry, can you repeat that? I just lost you. I said, so you're saying that from what you said, that you feel that there are impl implications beyond those immediately involved? Yes. Um, yes, I do. I think um, that this could lead to um, a debate and a discussion about what is included in the curriculum in the UK, in what students learn. I mean, I know it's already, the, histo the history curriculum is already packed, but surely there's room for stories like rebellions, because all we hear, um, all I understood from school was that, oh, we were slaves and that was about it. There's yeah. no kind of narrative about... Um, were there revolts? Did um, the slaves fight back, and so on? And what were the events and incidents that um, that are recorded where they where they fought back? I mean, you could see it in other cultures and so on, but not so much in Caribbean culture, where the um, the people who were shipped over to the Caribbean actually organized themselves, planned military um, military escapades to um, free themselves, and that's. Um, mostly unknown. So this will help, a project like this will help educate, I feel, and maybe start a debate, not just in um, education, but um, in universities too. And it's so, it's so core to the history of the time. So, um, you know, particularly research that's been published about, about Tacky recently, so someone like Vincent Brown's publications, where, you know, seeing the the you know tacky tacky's rebellion and then the 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 insurrections that followed as actually principal battles in military history in the seven years war things that you know people aren't considering them as being and and also that you know that idea of you know they were a lot of them trained soldiers um they'd been fighting in the wars in africa um and and the way that Taki's Rebellion was so cleverly planned and really strategically planned 
you know, that skill, that experience, which doesn't get talked about enough, is it was really vital. So it's it's sort of understanding that actually the history of Africa is fundamental to to um, the history of the period globally, but particularly that you know the history of or the, the Eurocentric history that's always told. Um, and and I think you know that's that wider picture of just not understanding how how significant um, events like this were. Was this this wasn't the only rebellion, obviously. Why was this so particularly significant and what did it lead to? Well, for me, um, people in the Caribbean heard slavers, people who were slaves um, had um, heard whispers of this rebellion. And um, let's not forget, only 30 years later, Toussaint Louverture started his rebellion in Haiti, the most successful um, slave rebellion in world history, where he beat the French and, and uh, fought off the Spanish and English. And so for me, in my mind, there's no doubt that Toussaint Louverture um, knew what happened in Jamaica and knew what he was trying to achieve. And so no doubt it was an inspiration for many. And in the piece that we're making, I want to make sure that we stay true to the story of bravery of, of these men. They stood up and made a stand against oppression. That's a key thing that um, we need to come through in, in the um, performance. And, you know, making parallels with, you know, today's history, present day history of activism. Um, and just to sort of bring it through that even though they were overthrown, they made a step forward and took a stand. So that is really important to us in the central message of K Moyers that we're going to be creating. Yes, they certainly the did. And sorry. No, go ahead. I'm just going to mention Haiti again and how close it is to Jamaica. I think what from tip to tip is something like only what 25, 25 or so miles. So there's no doubt that um people in Haiti heard about this revolution. Mm. and were inspired by it and um, they started planning I would guess immediately in forming um, well basically um, Toussaint Leverture had to form an army And what are the challenges uh, Deborah of um, portraying this story which is quite a complex story in terms of dance and music Well as I said um, we're not going into the um, creative research and development phase till October. So I'm sure that will throw up quite a lot of challenges. Um, but one of the um, challenges that I can foresee is the fact that there were lots of slave owners and Taki had a big army of people. Um, well, not comparatively, obviously, the slavers, but there was a mass of people and we're working with seven or eight performers. So we have to be able to communicate um, the feeling of that volume of people with a smaller cast. So that's going to be one of one of the challenges. But until we're actually in the rehearsal room, um, it's hard to know what we're going to come across. What's the most enlightening thing any of you have um, have got out of doing the, the the groundwork for for this project? I I think for me be brave be brave. <laughs> for me, um, working on this project with Breakfast Tower, it's it's um, satisfying to have an opportunity to tell the truth because about these key landmark buildings because people pass them every day people revere certain buildings and it's great to be a part of bringing the history of the buildings to attention to as many people as possible um because many of them have a dark history uh, and also um i think using music and dance and the written word to communicate this makes it is it as accessible as possible to people um, and it um, reaches people's imaginations and can bring the history to life. So that's been very important to me. I don't think you can um, 
atone. We, we can't reach atonement for um, what happened, but it's satisfying to have this opportunity um, to make connections across the past. And for me personally, as a black person, to have this voice um, to connect is valuable to my personal experience and hopefully to audiences. Alex, the book is, uh, is, is your baby. Um, how much will you be involved in the theatrical and musical interpretation? Well, as much as I'm able to, as much as I'm able to travel down, I've been um, unwell recently, but I will collaborate. I will, um, Deborah always uh, consult me. She's um, consulting me every step of the way so far. And so every step of the way, I will try to be there. And as, uh, how difficult will it be to be put this together as a, as a visual piece? Because obviously you can stay much more in words than you can physically. Well, I, I think that um, dance is a beautiful medium in which to communicate um, because it communicates beyond words. So it's accessible to everybody. And obviously it's, there's going to be certain abstractions, which there always is dance because it's not going to be mime and it's not spoken words, but I think um, dance has a very special way of connecting with people. Um, and again, people will interpret it in a lot of different, in different ways because it's all about, you know, personal interpretation when you see a visual thing. But hopefully we'll do our, you know, we'll dig deep and work hard to embody the feelings and the expression that comes through in the beautiful writing in the book. And Amy, what do you hope the central message of, of, of this project will be? Um, we, you know, we want it to really be very honest and and to to really explore, you know, the source of this wealth and not just the source of the wealth for Beckford and the building that we're in, but but the the wider context of that of 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 Bath in particular um you know a lot of people know quite a lot about Bristol down the road but but you know Bath is where all the profits and the products of transatlantic slavery um were dealt in and and that's our next webinar probably but um but it, it it's it's about kind of yes we're telling it through a particular place but actually that story that that history the things that we've kind of been talking about it's everywhere it's it's any sort of city that develops from the mid 17th century if not earlier onwards it's built into the roads it's built into the streets um and and it's so fundamental to understanding this country and and others um so we kind of think if we can use the tower as a way of really opening up that that story and that history then hopefully other places will will follow are you hoping to change the perception of, of beckford's tower for those who knows it know it th th through this yeah i think so it's been it's been really interesting talking to people over the over the sort of last 5 6 years as we've been developing our project for the museum um and talking to people who um you know often tell tell us the same stories you know i've i've lived in bath all my life i i can see the building from my my home when i'm doing the washing up in the kitchen um and and it's an in integral part of understanding like where i live and 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 where I call home and and often that will be kind of followed by you know then I discovered what paid for it and how it was paid for and and that that makes people change their perception of it um and and I you know I think we we want to really kind of take hold of that and and um and really explore how it, it can change a, a perception of a place but but how we can use it so the building is the tool that, that we can use to tell this story um and and to make sure that that story is accessible for as many people as possible so we, it's not just the building it's also the landscape around it so the landscape where where a lot of the 
um, performance in the development of, of the earlier project, College Unbound, took place. Um, and that's a, a, a landscape, a space in Bath that's free to access, um, a, an open green space that, that's, that's available for anyone to come into. Um, and so we want to use that space to be able to tell some of this story as well. So, you know, and, and you know, like Deborah and Alex have both said it's a lot of this is about accessibility and making things accessible to more people. So if we can tell this story without people having to pay to come into the museum, that would be, you know, that's that's amazing. I mean, obviously, we would like people to pay to come into the museum, but um you know we don't want that financial barrier to be there for people to perhaps engage with it or or just you know if every person that went walked away thinking I didn't know it was paid for from the the profits of enslavement or you know I would like to find out more about that then you know that that would be incredible and why should you're talking about targeting young people why should they care about this well, we went through the, um, I remember in Bristol where they tore down Colson statue. And for me, um, many young people were engaged in the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, there was an outcry about um, statues adorning um, buildings in uh, Oxford and places like that. So for me, a project like this is a natural next step. Let's aim to educate those young people about where this all started. Who um, who amass great fortunes from the proceeds and, and so forth. So they have a bit more um, know-how, a bit more know the structure of how slavery works. And I think that that is a service and young people should know that, you know, because if Black Lives Matter means anything, it means that um, we take a deep dive. And for me, uh, Taki's Rebellion and, and um, other narratives like that are taking deep dives of um, retelling history and reclaiming our history and making young people, well, not just young people, everybody, aware of that history. So that's very important for me. It's one of the reasons and motivations why I write. And uh, it's, a, it's a great theme in my work about reliving certain history that hasn't been told yet. I, I call them untold stories. Taki's Rebellion for me is an untold story, but for me, it should be a world story, just like people know of Achilles and so on. So that is how important it is to me. And Mary? Sorry, um, is that um, just to me? No, sorry, I'm Mary. I was asking Mary to expand on the Yeah, same. So, so I think, you know, young people care a lot. Um, and 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 I think they're also, you know, Alex mentioned about you know activism, and I th I think young people today, not not all of them, but a lot of young people today are very activist actually in 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 their thinking and and in what they care about. And actually, there's there's a lot who would say, why aren't we telling it? Um, so so I I think you know they're they're almost sometimes holding, you know, holding us and organisations and institutions and educational institutions to account. Um, and and I think, you know, the more that happens, the the more it it, it pushes forward um, the way that stories are told and 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 who they're told to and for and how they're told and who they're told by. And and I think there's also you know, increasingly the arts, you know, Deb has already mentioned it, increasingly the arts, culture, heritage are being less and less funded and less and less valued in terms of the impact that they make um, that is a value that can't be quantified in terms of um, the contribution that it makes. And um, it becomes harder and harder for people to access some of some of that and, and be part of that. So I think if we can engage young people it's more likely that they are going to be interested and involved with the arts dance music performance museums throughout their entire life um and and i think that's you know that's that investment in 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 the future and Deb, let me play devil's advocate i'm 15 16 17 years old 
why should I come and see this old story about slavery, which is, you know, decades, centuries even perhaps, um, beyond my experience? Yeah, well, it's not, um, first and foremost, it's not just for young people, it's for everybody. But we've been doing a lot of groundwork in schools and as well as, um, as Amy was saying, um, there's a lot of young people that are sort of activists and really interested in that. There's also a lot of people that know nothing or a racist basically and they just see black people as one thing so it gives them insight into a bit of the history and why things are as they are and hopefully if the penny drops in you know one young person's mind it's been a good thing so i think that um that's one reason why we target um young people and it's important but why should they come and see well you know Again, it's in the marketing. So you're not just selling it as a, you know, a deep thing for people to come and learn about slavery. It's also entertainment, dare I say it, you know, because we want people to be to, to be challenged, to be uplifted, to their emotions to be, you know, go through a roller yeah. coaster. So it's exciting. You know, why do people read books? You know, it's the same reason they might go and see uh, a show and a production. Well, that was my point. Yeah, a lot of people don't read books, so so you know they it, well, you need to be, right. you need to be entertained, don't you? Entertain is is paramount nowadays in in everything we do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, um, for me, when my mother first told me about Chief Tacky, it was a compelling story. Yeah. I mean, I'm a storyteller, and I love reading stories and hearing about stories, watching stories interpreted in any kind of form. And so um, you could ask the same question about why was Troy film with Brad Pitt and so on? Because it's a compelling story. It's why it's lasted over a thousand years, because the characters are compelling. We're interested, we're intrigued. And we want to know after the, um, the conclusion and the end credits roll, um, more about these characters, more about this history. And so we've been denied that so much in our culture. And so we have compelling stories too that can be entertaining, can compel you. And so for me, you know, our stories should not be undervalued because we're just as compelling as anybody else's. And what do you hope, we're gonna to get to some Q and A in a minute, I hope, and, um, but what do you hope the legacy of this project will be? Is that for me? That is for, for, for all of you, you're all involved. Um, for me personally, I really hope, obviously, it's a, um, it's a project that I want the wider world to see. I can see this going on tour. I can see this playing South Africa, Asia, wherever it may be. But uh, my passion is writing for young people. I really want young people to be educated about these histories, these narratives. That, that is my passion. And Amy? I think we want to it to be like the start of a conversation that the museum is having. Um, we want it to, um, you know, provoke discussion and debate when people are in the space, in the museum, leaving. Um, and we want it to really kind of be the beginning of finding out more in particular, doing making more opportunities for people to research more um, and to try and find some of those voices that are harder to find but are there. I mean the the frustration is is that the stories are told, you know, the stories of these cane warriors are told through the documents of their enemies because those are the ones that have survived and 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 there has to be more there and and there has to be more there about all of the people that that were held in enslavement on Beckford plantations um and and that research just hasn't been done and I think you know if there's a legacy we we would like to make opportunities for 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 people to to do that research and to find out more and to tell more of these stories and Deb have you any legacy hopes well um that it's a, a great um, performance and project and will lead to the development of a full scale, full length piece. Um, I also want 
to have a legacy with the people that had a workshop that it's provoked them and changed their thinking in some way. Um, and also I'd like to think of it as a, a, a blueprint model for um, working with the written word, Alex, mm -hmm. and um, music and dance to tell the stories and hidden histories of all 93 um, um, listed buildings in the National Trust report that are, are notorious for having built, built um, been built on the money from slavery. Okay, let's get some Q and A now. Um, got a question here. If anybody can answer this, how will you support visitors who find this subject triggering? Um, I can answer from from the museum. So we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment about also preparing visitors. So ensuring that there's a a, um, a sensitivity statement or a care statement, so that people that 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 visit the site might um, know that there are, are, are subjects or, or themes within the museum that are um, around exploitation and, and enslavement. Um, and um, also training our staff so that, that um, if anyone that's visiting is triggered, um, our staff are able to support them. Um, and creating a space where, you know, if you just want to leave the museum, um, there's a space outside in the landscape, which while still being part of the sort of landscape of the tower, um, um, after after Beckford's ownership, the building became a funeral chapel and it's a cemetery and it's it's got a, um, a very open view. And so we want to create a space outside where people can just go back out into the landscape, look at the view and and go away from the content of the museum if if they want to. Okay, I, I confess these Q&As seem to be targeting you, Amy. So um, forgive me, I'm, I'm not picking on you. I um, mean, here's one, the Beckford Trust owns the tower. Has there been any discussion about reparations, issuing an apology and any other possibilities on reparations or restorative justice? We have, we have been, um, talking recently in particular about about restorative justice and what reparation might be or might look like um and i think that in particular is tied up with like i said earlier kind of making opportunities um and trying to create opportunities or fund opportunities um that might make history museums um interpretation more inclusive um and 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 particularly um the the workforce or the sector um which, which continues to be an incredibly white sector sector um more more diverse um and like with all the things that that, that we're doing and we're working on we're having conversations and listening to a lot of people and i think as as our project moves forward, um, as we start to see what happens when we reopen the doors of the museum, I think those are those are conversations that that we're going to kind of continue to have and take to a deeper level. There's one for Alex here. How do you think museums and buildings like Beckford's Tower, which have clear links to the slave trade, could be more active in in acknowledging and presenting these important aspects of history? I definitely think they should engage more with schools and other educational institutions so people are aware of what they hold or what archival material they may have. And so I think that's very important. And I think that um, there should be uh, courses led by um, professors and so on who uh, lead the study in these fields. And Amy, um... Stories of the source of the money that built Bath has, has, haven't been wildly told. Uh, have you met any resistance to telling this particular story? Um, yes, some. And, and I think what we've seen in the last few years, particularly in the sort of so-called culture wars, has, has you know, it's been a, an example of that. Um, I think... Not as much as perhaps um, uh, people might assume, um, and I think that's that's largely down to just how 
sort of brutally honest we are and and open we are and and how committed we are to to telling the story and 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 have the full support of our trustees and our our leadership so and that's just so important that that you know we can confidently do this work because we have the support of of our board of governors for as a as a charity um and and i think there's there's always going to be resistance um and particularly in bath and we're we're part of a, a larger group across the city um who are trying to ensure that the history of bath when it's told is an inclusive history and it's not sort of um the yes but history which happens in bath you know yes almost two-thirds of the city was paid for from the profits of slavery but William Wilberforce got married here which is what you often hear so you know we don't want that yes but history um so so there is always going to be resistance against it there's always going to be people that say you're taking away history when of course which is ridiculous of course we're not we're just giving people more history we're telling more stories um, and you know that's the that's the fundamental part of what we're doing. Deborah, how would you react to somebody who said this is a story that doesn't necessarily need to be need to be told? I wouldn't. I would be stunned at how ignorant the people <laughs> was that might um, make that statement, and I would say you know that uh, it's important to know what's in our on, on our doorstep in our environment and it's important in order to you know develop understanding between people that we acknowledge our history and our past so i you know i think it is very important that we tell this history and i think it's really pioneering um this is a pioneering project i don't i can't see that this kind of level of engagement um, between arts and a museum and history has taken place before so i hope that this you know, will, will be a, a blueprint and a legacy to build on. Yeah, I mean, you can see why I'm playing devil's advocate there, because, you know, obviously I, I live in the southern United States and there's many times when these kind of stories, people say it's in the past. We don't need to know this, you know, won't move on. So you're inevitably going to get that kind of response from some circles. We're all a product of our past. So the more we understand what's and acknowledge what's happened in the past, the more hope there is for, you know, mutual understanding, surely. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Like I say, that's devil's advocate. <laughs> um, um, Alex, you yeah. mentioned earlier that um, this is a story that hasn't been told there in Britain, but what is the education on this rebellion in Jamaica? Is there any? That's that's a very important question. In fact, um, in in recent years, there has been a movement. There's um, a friend of mine, well, not a friend of mine, acquaintance I know, called Derek X. And he was so um, involved and engaged in Chief Taki's story that he decided to do a march from where he lives in Port Royal to where, um, to, uh, well, to Kingston. And he complained that Chief Tucky should be a national hero. Now, that was covered in the newspapers. Uh, people have started to engage in that story. Uh, Vincent Brown's book um, really helped that cause as well. Hopefully mine will too in the future. So um, there's a gathering. There's a gathering kind of force that um, this story should be acknowledged. This story should be taught in schools. And so on. Obviously, Jamaican schools do not have the funds to um, buy every book for every child in, in, in every school. But the hope is, is that there will be more awareness of um, Chief Taki's story. I mean, there is, if you go to St. Mary, there is, there is um, a school named after Chief Taki. There's a falls named after him. Recently, there was a road named after him. So there's a growing awareness of that history and what Chief Taki tried to achieve. And that it's gathering all the time and gathering awareness. Yeah, you know, we've had messages on social media that have said, hey, at last, you know, you're telling Taki's story. So I think, yeah, in the Caribbean, particularly in Jamaica, there is a lot of interest more and more, you know, as the project goes out on social media, there's much more engagement. 
So yeah, it is relevant to um, people in Jamaica and we'd like to take it there. Yes, that, that would be fantastic yeah. if we did. Are Taki's descendants still around? Yes. Yeah. Yes, in fact, um, several were located. I think in the Ghana, um, in, in Ghana, and they were invited to um, Chief Taki Day that they have in Jamaica in St. Mary. And there was a celebration there, I believe, um, earlier this year. And so, as I said, there's a gathering awareness and acknowledgement of what Chief Taki tried to achieve. Wouldn't that be wonderful to get them involved in it? Oh, yes, that would be <laughs> wonderful indeed. All right, well, and we're nearing the end of our time. Um, so this production, when does it go? You're, you're in the pre-production at the moment, is that is that right, Deborah? Yeah, um, our um, research and development project is in October and they'll be sharing at the end of that. Um, and then we bring it to Bristol and Bath next March. So if people, you know, keep in touch on social media, we're going to be performing a version of it at Beckford Tower and also at Arnold Feeney in Bristol um, and potentially another venue in Bath, which is under discussion. So we will be able to share the outcome and we'll have the film footage and everything on our both Beckford Tower and our State of Trust social media. And I never touched on how, how is this being funded? Uh, we have a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, oh. which we're very grateful for. <laughs> so I'm sure you are. OK, well, that's all we got time for. Uh, thanks to the panel. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And it is very enlightening. And I think the key thing to come out of this is that you're creating an awareness and then people can make uh, their own judgment based on what they see. Um, so Alex, Amy and Deborah, um, Great to talk to you. And if you'd like to take part in the audience survey for this event, uh, you can use the QR code, which will be coming up on our screen, or you can go to the link in our chat box. We're back with the second webinar of the series on September 27th. But for now, I'm Terry Badu, and thanks very much for watching us.